There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Welcome to Preach the Word with Brother Dean Carmichael of Greensboro. And now let's welcome our dear friend, Brother Dean. 1 Samuel chapter number 7. 1 Samuel chapter number 7 and verse number 15. Again, happy Mother's Day. We're live on Facebook. Got some people watching. Um, happy Mother's Day, Mom. Um, thank you all for watching this morning. This message is for everybody. We're here to glorify the Lord this morning. We're honoring our mothers. But we pray that the Lord would get the glory and that we would have a good service this morning. Alright, 1 Samuel chapter number 7. And I'm going to read verse 7, 15 through 17. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah and judged Israel in all those places. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house. And there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. Thank you, dear Lord, this morning for the opportunity to preach your word, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your sweet spirit here this morning. Lord, I feel liberty to preach this morning, God. I ask you, dear Lord, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that in no way, shape, or form the devil would hinder this service. I pray, Lord, that no way the child of God would do anything to gr grieve or quench your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, for each and every person who, hears, who is here this morning, who is listening to this message, whether it be here or at home, I pray, God, that you would touch them. Lord, convict them. Pierce their hearts, dear God. Lord, I, I'm not in charge of anyone getting saved this morning. I'm not in charge of anyone getting their heart right. I'm just in charge of delivering them your message. And I pray this morning that you would clear my, my mind, dear Lord. Touch me, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me power from on high to preach your message. Lord, that we would feel your presence in this place. That we could, Lord, before we even leave this morning, get our hearts right with you, whatever the need may be. For we say all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Here in the book of 1 Samuel, I just read verses that are talking about a very godly man. Very godly man by the name of Samuel. He was the final judge of the judges period. The judges stage was a very dark time in Israel's history. We all know about David. We all know about how he was the great king of Israel there before Israel was divided, before they went into captivity, before the Babylonians took the southern kingdom, before the Assyrians took the northern kingdom, Israel was one. There was a great king Solomon. His father was David. And before David, there was Saul. But before the, the divided kingdom stage, before uh, the captivity, before all of that happened, there was something called the judges stage. And the judges stage was right after Moses and Joshua's era. We all know the story about how Moses delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. And when Moses died, Joshua took over. And when Joshua died, the Bible says that every man did that which was right in his own eyes. In Israel, they would sin, they would turn away from God, and God would give them over to captivity. And then they would ask the Lord to deliver them. They would repent for their sins. They would put away the strange gods. So then what would God do? He would rise up a deliverer. One who would take the children of Israel and defeat their enemies and deliver them, and they would judge Israel. Some of the most famous judges that we all know, we've heard about, you hear uh, Gideon and Samson. And there's Othniel, the relative of Caleb. And there was um, uh, Ehud and Shamgar. And there was uh, Deborah and Barak. There were so many different judges. And the last judge of the judges' stage co covers a period of about 300 years. The last judge of that stage was a man by the name of Samuel. The Bible says Samuel was a godly man. Samuel was a man who preached repentance. 
Samuel was a man who told Israel they needed to turn away from their sins. He gathered them all at Mizpah. And while they were being captive by the Philistines, Samuel told all of them, you need to put the strange gods away. You need to turn back to the Lord. And they repented and they even asked Samuel to go to the Lord on their behalf. That's how godly Samuel was. And Samuel, God used Samuel to deliver Israel. They put up a stone of remembrance. And the Bible says that Samuel judged Israel and he preached. He was a circuit riding preacher. He preached all around Israel. But behind Samuel, I want you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. Before there was Samuel, but there, he had a godly mother. Abraham Lincoln quoted, said here, and I have it written down, maybe I might have lost in my notes here. But anyway, I'll get to that in just a minute. But Samuel was a very godly man. He was godly before the Lord. He judged Israel. Uh, he even anointed Saul as king, anointed David as king. But behind Samuel was a woman by the name of Hannah. And by way of introduction, I want to look at Samuel's mother. I want to look at Hannah. And in chapter number 2, look if you would in verse number 1. It says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in the and thy salvation. Behind the godly man Samuel was a godly mother named Hannah. The man who preached repentance, the man who God used to bring Israel back to him before they would anoint a king, was a godly woman who prayed and asked the Lord for a son. And first of all, by way of introduction, I want to look at Hannah... The word Hannah, the name Hannah there means grace. And she was the wife of Elkanah. And Elkanah actually had another wife named Peninnah. And God never intended man to have two wives, and that's why this, this really didn't work out between them. They had some home troubles. And by way of introduction, I want to look at, first of all, Hannah's pain. The pain that Hannah went through. If you look here in of chapter chapter number 2. Look if you would in verse number 2. This is talking about Elkanah. It says, And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Look here in verse number 5. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. Who was her adversary? Well, her adversary was Penina. That was Elkanah's other wife. And she would scoff at Hannah and she would put Hannah down because she was barren. And Penina had many children. She gave Elkanah many sons and daughters, but yet Hannah, her womb was shut up. And this grieved Hannah. This made her very sorrowful. She was very upset over this, that she could not have any children. Um, on a yearly basis, Elkanah would go to Shiloh, and he would go to worship, he would go to sacrifice, and he gave portions to his wife and her children, but he would give extra to Hannah, because he loved Hannah. But yet she was, she was barren. And if you look here, I believe in verse number 10, it says, And wept sore. The Bible says she was bitterness of the soul. It describes her disappointment. She's upset. She couldn't have any children. We see Hannah's pain by way of introduction. Then in number 2, we see Hannah's plea. In verse number 11 and 12. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, 
Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now I want to point out one thing to you. This is Old Testament. The entire Bible, there's one subject, and that's Jesus Christ. The entire Bible, the subject is Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. And there's actually a very prophetic message here in chapter 2 that I'm going to show you. First time Messiah is ever mentioned there in the Bible. That's through Hannah, of uh, that word anointed. As there's a lot there, which is the Greek word for Christ, where we get the word Christ. But anyway, um, here um, in the Old Testament times, Hannah, they're looking to, they're obeying the Lord. They're looking, what's that great sacrifice going to be? Her husband went on a yearly and sacrificed there to Shiloh to worship. And Hannah would pray to the Lord and she made a vow, she made a promise. Two promises Hannah made. First of all, he would be a priest in the Levitical service all the days of his life. She said, Lord, if you give me a man child, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. I want him to serve you. If you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. Friends, we ought to give our children back to the Lord. You have children this morning? You ought to dedicate them to the Lord. You ought to raise them right. That's why Hannah, she promised she's going to do that. And then she also said that she would make him a Nazarite. Uh, what that meant was that he would be separated into the service of God. He was going to be um, separated unto the Lord. She said, Lord, if you give me a son... I'll be sure, I'll, I'll dedicate his life to you, and he'll serve you all the days of his life. We see Hannah's pain, we see Hannah's plea, but then we see Hannah's pleasure. The name Samuel actually means heard of God. God would bless Hannah. The Bible says her and her husband came together, and they knew each other, and she would have a baby, a boy baby named Samuel. And here in in uh, chapter number 2, look at verse number uh, 26. After she, uh, after uh, her and Samuel there, she's going to take him to Eli. And Samuel is going to uh, begin to serve the Lord. He's going to be raised there. And it says here in verse number, uh, let's look here at verse number 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her three bullocks, and one ephah of flour, and a bottle of wine, and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am a woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Isn't that a blessing, that verse? I remember one night I preached. I preached on John the Baptist. I remember this night like it was yesterday. I preached a message about John the Baptist, I think, about John the Baptist. So maybe I don't remember like it was yesterday. But anyway, preached a message, and this was when we were living in the apartment. And uh, I was in the other room. Lauren said, Dean, why don't you come here for a minute? I said, okay. He said, can you read that, that verse for me real quick? When I read that verse, that's how she told me that she's pregnant with Coburn. And that, I tell you, man, that, that's, a, that's a special verse. Hannah prayed. Samuel thought she was, or uh, Eli, Eli thought she was drunk. Because she was praying. Her mouth was moving, but no noise was coming out. What was she doing? She's praying in her heart. She's weeping. She was going before God. She was a praying woman. And Eli went up to her. And here in chapter 2, verse 18... He said, or excuse me, verse, chapter 1, And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Eli told her to go in peace, and the Lord touched her. This morning, I want to look here. Uh-oh. Let's see here. I think I'm missing my notes. Boy, I had trouble. Tell you what, I've had trouble with my notes all week. I'm missing a whole page. But anyway, 
I had trouble Sunday as well. But I want to talk this morning on the subject, Samuel's godly mother. Samuel's godly mother. We talked this morning about how Samuel was a godly man, about how he preached repentance, how he preached and got Israel back to where they needed to be, how he told them they needed to turn away from those false idols, and behind him was a godly woman. And I want to look at three things this morning about how Hannah was a godly mother. Number one, Hannah was godly because of her salvation. Look here in 1 Samuel chapter number 2. Look at verse number 1. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted. That means her strength is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Number one, Hannah was a godly mother because of her salvation. Like I said, friends, this is the Old Testament. They are looking to. They're being obedient. They know that one day God is going to bring a sacrifice. He's going to bring that great sacrifice. He's going to bring His Messiah. They weren't sure who it was. But they were being obedient. They were looking to the great sacrifice. And Hannah was a godly woman. And this morning, if you want to be a godly woman, if you want to be the mother that your children need in this present day and age, if you want to be the mother that your children need to see to be the right example and to have the right kind of love and to give them the right kind of direction, in order to be a godly woman, number one, you need to be saved this morning. Salvation is key. Friends, we need to take care of of the sin problem. That's number one. How was Hannah a godly mother? How could you leave this morning a godly mother? Number one, you need salvation. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 3, verse number 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're here this morning you say, Preacher, you don't understand what I've done. And I'm not just preaching to the mothers, I'm preaching to everybody. You say, Preacher, you don't understand what I've done. You don't understand the things that I've done. Listen, if you never took that drink, if you never smoked that joint, if you never got into those drugs, if you've only been with one man your entire life and that was your husband through holy matrimony, if you're a man this morning, you've all, the only woman you've been with is your wife through holy matrimony, you've gone to church your whole life, if you're to die without Jesus Christ this morning, you'd die and go to hell. Say, well, preacher, you don't have to listen. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are powerful testimonies. There are people who they lived out in sin. God saved them miraculously. There are people who God saved at a young age. Samuel here, he was called of God at an early age. God called to him. Samuel thought it was Eli calling his name. He'd get up, walk in there, and what do you want? I'm trying to sleep. He was It wasn't Eli. It was God. He caught him at an early age. Jeremiah caught him at an early age. John the Baptist, early age. Paul the Apostle, not an early age. Paul killed Christians. Evilest man that ever walked on the face of this earth. God saved him by His marvelous grace. If you look at your New Testament, the majority of your New Testament was written by the, the evilest man who ever walked on this earth. His name was Saul of Tarsus. The Ethiopian eunuch. There's so many different examples. The Philippian jailer. Living out in sin. God miraculously saved them. Any of those people I just mentioned, if they die with unbelief, rejecting God's terms of salvation, which in this Bible is Jesus Christ, they die and go to hell. If you're here this morning... You do not have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. This Bible says... If you were to die today, step out into eternity, you'd spend eternity in a devil's hell. That's what the Bible says. If you want to be a godly mother, first thing you need, you need salvation. You need to get this right first. We need to take care of that sin problem. We need to get our hearts right with God. 
People say, well, if I could just start living right, I'd get back in church. No, you, just, you need to go to church first and let the Lord take care of that. Well, I'll start serving the Lord if I could just get rid of that one thing. You give your heart to God, He'll take care of that. Amen. That's what repentance is. It's a popular preaching today. And it's wrong that repentance is belief to unbelief. That is not repentance, friends. Just believe. That's not repentance. Repentance is a change of mind towards sin. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. That's the payment of sin. That's the payment of being a sinner. I say this more not to embarrass them, but I have a testimony of my parents. God saved my dad literally on a bar stool. He saved my mom on a church pew. I've heard my dad say it like that before. They were both on their way to hell. They are both lost. My mom was trying to live good, tender heart. You know my mom. Loving individual. Went to church, read her Bible. Went to a revival one night, fell under conviction. Realized she wasn't saved. Same revival. My dad, he got saved. Friends, it don't matter what your past is this morning. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you might, you might want to take action this morning. No matter where you've been and what you've done, the Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God did not create hell for us. He created it for the devil and his demons, but we sinned. Adam sinned in the garden. God cannot accept sin into heaven. But the Bible says, Peter told the church there, he said, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. God is not willing that you die and go to hell this morning. Mama, if you're saved this morning, he doesn't want your children to go to hell. We should love our family enough, amen, we don't want them to die and go to hell. We should pray for them. Amen. The first thing we need in the home, we need saved mamas and daddies. Amen. Mama needs to be saved. Daddy needs to be saved. Then they get married in holy matrimony. In the eyes of God, they get married. Then they have children. And they raise their children right. That is what, that's how God intended the home to be. According to this Bible. See, Hannah, number one, she was a godly mother because of her salvation says here that the Lord was her rock. That's who she leaned on. Number two, Hannah was a godly mother because of her sanctification. In chapter number two, in verses three through nine, Hannah says, Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. That's a humble woman there. That's a very wise woman speaking right now. The, the bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven. And she hath many children and wax feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. Job said, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hannah goes on to say, The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunk hill to set them among the princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory, for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and He has set the world upon them. Not only was Hannah a godly woman because of her salvation, but she was also a godly woman because of her sanctification. That word sanctify means to set apart. Mom, do you want to be godly this morning? Number one, you need to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. You need to turn away from those sins and realize that Jesus Christ, when He died on the cross, He died for your sins. And this morning, if you ask Him to forgive you of all, of all your sins and accept Him as your Lord and Savior, He will save you and change your life. 
You will be a child of God. You will have a home in heaven. That's number one. That's salvation. Number two is sanctification. Mom, we need to be set apart. You need to be someone that God has intended you to be. Turn here to the book of Proverbs chapter number 31. Proverbs chapter number 31. Read here verse number 10. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? Virtuous. That's a woman with character. This is a woman like Hannah. This is a godly woman. This is a woman who's meek and humble. This is a woman who loves the Lord. This is a woman who has met the standards of what God has intended the woman to be. The Bible says her price is far above rubies. I know not everybody does, not everybody's fortunate, but if you have a godly woman in your life, you should thank the Lord for her every day. If you had a godly woman in your life, you should thank the Lord for her every day. The Bible says her price is far above rubies. There's nothing to be compared to that. It says here in verse 11, The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her maidens. This is a godly woman. This is a woman who's set apart. This is a woman who's serving. This morning, the church, but most importantly, the home, we have mothers. You saw this morning. We have mothers all over the place. There's mothers all over churches, all over Greensboro. There's mothers everywhere. You can't go very far. If you say, hey, mom, there'll be about 15, 20 women turn around and say what? Amen. There's mamas everywhere. But how many of those mamas are godly women who are set apart? Sanctified. Set apart for service. Humble women, meek women, women who love the Lord, submissive women. The Bible says, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. The great preacher Samuel behind that man was a godly, virtuous woman by the name of Hannah. She was set apart. She was set apart for service there. It says, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. She was leaning on the Lord this morning. Mom, are you leaning on the Lord this morning? Are you putting your trust in Him? Are you serving Him? Are you set apart for His service? We see she was a godly woman, number one, because of her salvation. Number two, because of her sanctification, she was set apart. And number three, because of her strength. Chapter number two, verse number seven, or excuse me, verse number eight. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes, and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. He has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of His saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. Verse number 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he, the thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and He shall give strength unto His king, and exalt the horn of His anointed. 
Not only was she a godly mother because of her salvation, not only was she a, a godly mother because of her sanctification, that was her devotion, but also she's a godly mother because of her strength. Mom, can I say something to you this morning? Before you can be a godly mother, you need to be a godly wife. Before you can be a godly mother to your children, you need to be a godly wife to your husband. First time I ever got on a plane, I had the wonderful honor and privilege of sitting on the emergency door section. You know, where they walk up to you and say, can I get a verbal nod if this thing were to go down you knock that thing open? And you're sitting there going, mm-hmm. Because I'm going to be the first one out. This poor guy sitting right here at the window, he don't stand a chance. Because this thing's going down, I'm going over him first. Then I'm going to get out. Anyway. Then they give the instructions about the oxygen mask and what to do if they were an emergency. If you've ever been on a plane, they always instruct you to put your mask on first and then assist someone else. Because if you can't breathe, folks, you can't help anybody. Because you can't breathe. How can you raise your children if you don't have a healthy relationship with your husband? How can you raise your children in the right way and be able to give them and care for them and nurture them and give them what they need if your heart ain't right with the Lord. God gives us, He lays it out, what the job and the duties are for a wife. The wife's duties, Titus chapter 2, verse 4, is to love her husband. Ephesians 5, 22-24, she's to submit to her husband. She's to have a meek and a quiet spirit. It's what the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, or excuse me, 1 Peter 3, chapter 4. I'm going to also read another verse out of 1 Peter here. 1 Peter chapter number 3 as well. 1 Peter chapter number 3, if I can get to it here. <coughs> Tell you, the devil does not want me preaching this message. My goodness. First Peter chapter three, verse one through five. But even before that, I'll read that here in a minute. But she's to keep the home. That's what the Bible says. Mothers to submit to her husband, to love her husband, to keep the home. She's to be trustworthy, do her husband good and not evil. She's to meet the physical needs of her husband. And here in, in 1 Peter 3, verse 1 through 5, she's to preach to her husband in her manner of life, not her words. 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse number 1 through 5, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, Who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair, wearing of gold, or putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Amen? How great of a price? Well, it's worth more than rubies, we know that much. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Mamas, before you can be a godly mother, amen, before you can really instruct your children and be that godly mother God intended you to be, you need to have your heart right with Him. Hannah was a godly woman. How was she able to do that? How can a woman this morning be able to be the godly woman that God wants her to be only through His strength. That's the only way. Only through the strength of the Lord can Dad be the godly husband and father that he needs to be and can Mom be the godly wife and mother that she needs to be. Hannah said, There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Godly mother this morning, you, number one, you need salvation. Number two, you need sanctification. You need to live for the Lord. And last of all, you need His strength. That's the only way you'll be able to do it.
Every head bowed, every eyes closed. I ask Lori to come and just play, maybe play Amazing Grace for us, if, if she don't mind. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. If you have a godly mother, you will not forget that. Regardless of what path a child takes when they grow up, they will never forget that godly woman who prayed for them. That godly woman who cried their name out before God, Lord, don't let my children go to hell, who prayed and, and cried out to God and served God and showed that she loved the Lord through her actions, through being faithful to the house of God, being faithful to the man of God, being faithful and submissive to her husband, ultimately serving the Lord, a child will not forget that. She's going to play the altars open this morning. Every head's bowed, every eyes are closed. No one's looking around right now. I'm the only one looking around. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to come to you and make you come down here and get saved. I'm not going to do that. I just want to pray for you. You're here this morning. You say, Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. Will you pray for me? Is there anybody like that would raise their hand? I'll pray for you. All right. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. Mama, this morning, you want to be a godly mother to your children? The name Hannah means grace. God touched Hannah. Had his hand on her. It's only through grace can you be that Christian mother that the Lord wants you to be. It's only through His strength will you be able to do that. I want you to come up to this altar. Ask the Lord to give you what you need to be that godly mother. Altar's open. I thank God for my mom and my grandmothers and my wife. Thank God for the good Christian women we have in this church. A lot of them are like my mom, to be honest with you. The ones you want are like my grandma and the other ones are like my sisters. Amen. We've all grown up together. Godly women. If you're here this morning. God's blessed you. You have children. Number one, you ought to care about your own soul enough to know you're saved. But number two, you ought to care about your children to know that they're saved. Make sure they know the truth. You say, well, preacher, I want my children to decide for themselves. Well, why don't you let them hear the truth first? Let them decide once they hear the truth. We have free will. That's in the Bible. Eh? No one's forced. I'm not forcing anybody to get saved this morning. It wouldn't be real. God does the saving. That's His job. But it's our job to make sure they know the truth. That's what that verse means. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. What that means is, if you train a child through the Word of God when they're older, they won't forget that regardless of what they choose. The altar's open this morning, folks. You come, you pray. Amen. Well, if you would look this way, I believe that's the... Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Thank you for listening to Preach the Word with Brother Dean Carmichael from Greensboro. You can email Brother Dean, preach the word 87 at Outlook.com. Preach the word 87 at Outlook.com. You also can follow our dear friend Brother Dean Carmichael on Facebook. Facebook.com forward slash Dean Carmichael Jr.